Please open your Bibles, if you will, to the book of 2 Kings, chapter 10. 2 Kings, chapter 10 for this evening. And uh, I noticed that Barbara is here, and so I want yeah. a special recognition. Yeah. I'm so glad you're out of the hospital, sis, and with us. Uh, in fact, our Wednesday, our, actually our Saturday worship was was a Barbara prayer meeting, really. Was and I'm so grateful. Thank you so much. Absolutely. We love you. We so, love you. Okay, good. Yeah. You're feeling good? I'm great. Yeah. Can I just share one quick little Please, thing? Please, yeah. I've had this thing happen to me three times, and, and I always visualize everything kind of like you do. And um, I always visualize at the peak of this that I'm standing at the door. If the Lord opens the door, that's when I'll be going home. So I stand at the door and wait, and the, the most peaceful, blessed moment of my life will be when the door opens. Yes. And right up to, to that time, Satan will try to steal your peace from you. Mm -hmm. Watch out. Yeah. 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 Every moment's precious. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. a beautiful word, sis. And yeah. thank you so much. That touches yeah. my heart, and that is right on. And that's from somebody who knows the peace that passes understanding. <laughs> Amen. Let's go. Second Kings chapter 10. This is really almost like a part two to chapter nine, so I'm just calling it Clean House Continues. And uh, let's pray. Father, again, we just thank you, Father, that Barbara's here with us, that you're with us tonight, Lord. That, uh, worship was so wonderful this evening. We thank you for your word, and we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you desire to teach us. We thank you that in the sanctification process, you are forming us more into the image of your dear son. So, Lord, just take control. Please help me to get out of the way so that you can accomplish in us what you want to do through your word tonight. Bless, I pray in Jesus' wonderful name, and everybody says, Amen. 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 So, last week was a very tough chapter indeed. It was, uh, I guess you could call it a brutal chapter because really the Lord called for judgment. He had been waiting for Israel, the northern kingdom, the ten tribes in the north, to turn and to serve him. And they just keep getting further and further away. And they're being led by some pretty uh, horrible <laughs> leaders that were moving them further and further away from God. So God said, rather than to have you go any further, what the Lord did was he installed a new king, which was one of the commanders of the current king, and his name was Jehu. So Jehu's an important character in the northern tribe of Israel. But God made him king with a very specific purpose in mind. The purpose in mind that God brought him on board, I guess you could say, was to bring the promised end to the rule of the descendants of Ahab and Jezebel. So warnings had gone out to this group, repeated warnings, and they were ignored, unheeded. And I guess you could say, as has been said about justice before, but in particular, God's justice. The wheels of God's justice roll slowly, but they grind exceedingly fine. So last week we saw the death of two kings, Joram in the north, the son of Ahab, and also Ahaziah, king of Judah in the southern kingdom. Uh, both of them uh, really uh, were deserving of God's judgment, and God's judgment finally came. We also saw the death of Jezebel, and uh, down she came with a great fall and uh, hit hard on the ground, and then uh, Jehu decided to run her over a few times. So, I mean, it really was. So are you ready for more of that? Yeah. 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 I, don't know. It's, uh, I don't know what to say about that. So let me just, I'm going to tell you ahead of time. I'm going to try and alleviate some of the shock factor and tell you what's coming. Tonight we're going to see Ahab's 70 sons killed. Uh, we're going to see the rest of Ahab's family killed. We're going to see the worshipers of Baal killed. And then finally, the death of Jehu himself, King Jehu. I, 
before I jumped into this, and I think I mentioned this last week that I really had to spend a lot of time just contemplating uh, the last couple of chapters to get a proper perspective in my own mind. Now look, I know there's some chapters that we go through in the Old Testament, and they're shocking, aren't they? We go, what? What? Oh, oh my gosh, that's, wow, that's amazing. I think uh, there were some kids that we might have had in the service uh, last week that, that, that didn't come in. So uh, I understand that. I understand that. But uh, some of these things we look at, but I want to give you another way to approach the idea of God's judgment that perhaps we didn't discuss last week and you may have not looked at this before in this manner. I think each one of us here, as I look across the room, yes sir, I'm betting that each one of us has a longing desire in our hearts to see across the world the end of evil rule and evil rulers. Wouldn't we say that? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. We, we want that. And as a matter of fact, we not only want that, but we really what we do want is the righteous rule of Jesus Christ, who will literally, physically rule uh, from Jerusalem and sit on the throne of David. So we pray what? Come quickly, Lord mm -hmm. Jesus. Don't we pray that? And I think we all want that desperately. But there it is right there. And what I mean by there it is, if you look to the book of Revelation, you find out that right before Christ returns, right before he rules and reigns uh, from the city of David, there's great judgment that falls on the earth. In fact, it's so horrible a judgment that Jesus said, hey, look, uh, I'm going to cut short those days because if I didn't cut those days short, no flesh would survive. He also said it's going to be worse than it has ever been on this planet or ever will be again. So that's what's coming when we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If you think evil is just going to roll over and play dead at the sound of that, it's not. In fact, mm -hmm. Satan knows his days are shortened, so what does he do? S steps it up. <laughs> so... We even find at the end of the age that the angels themselves get involved in this. And they're actually sent out from heaven, these angels, specifically to separate the sheep, God's sheep, from the goats. So it, I, I, I'm just staggered at the thought of that. Sometimes we talk about riding back with Jesus, don't we? When Jesus comes back, we're just like... Yeah, that'll be so great and so exciting when we ride back with Jesus. Ah, but if you look at the book of Revelation, when Jesus rides back, it's going to be a totally bloody experience. As a matter of fact, it says that the blood is going to go right up to the top of the saddle. Is that how it reads? So I want you to think about that for just a moment that when we pray for these things to understand, to put a stop to what's going on, uh, evil's just not going to stop. There has to be a specific time of judgment, and that judgment is coming. So here we are now with Jehu, and Jehu is still on a roll, <coughs> if you will. And I also believe this, that at this particular time, Jehu is hearing a lot of cheering from the crowds at what he's doing. I think, I think there's a lot of people that are just thrilled at what Jehu is doing. And the reason why they're thrilled is because he's putting an end to a lineage of kings that have really ruled very harshly and very in a very evil manner. And I don't know how you would feel if uh, somebody broke into your house and, and took a couple of your kids and said, we need some sacrifices to Baal, so we're going to take the, your kids. Boy, you would be wanting that, you know, that lineage to come to an end. So as they're seeing Jehu ride in and, and, and all this death and destruction, they're happy that these guys are being replaced. Let's take a look at it. 2 Kings 10, verse 1. Now Ahab had 70 sons in Samaria. And Samaria is the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. And Jehu, that's the newly installed king, uh, anointed, wrote and sent letters to Samaria 
to the rulers of Jezreel, to the elders, and to those who reared Ahab's sons, saying, oh, okay, hold up for just a second. Let's get this clear. Jehu just doesn't go charging in to Samaria and start a war. And I think that he's wise to do that. And here's the reason why I think he's wise to do that. Because we've seen, actually, uh, like one, two, three, four, probably five cases now of people that he said, are you for me or are you against me? Because if you're for me, you better jump in line behind me, right? Mm -hmm. And they jumped in line behind him. Two guys right in a row that were trusted men of the king of Israel. And then, uh, and then uh, when he uh, went after uh, Jezebel, he said, she's talking to him, really talking down to him, not only literally, you know, but figuratively talking <coughs> down to him. And he shouts back up there, hey, anybody up there on my side? And a couple of guys come to the window and they go, we are her trusted servants. And they toss her out. He says, well, if you're on my side, then toss her out the window. <laughs> and they did. So I think he's thinking to himself, hey, look, I've got some people that are seem to be trading alliances from those that have been following Ahab very quickly to follow me. So he says, rather than to ride the 25 or 30 miles ready for battle, maybe I'll see if I can solve this by letter. So, of course, they didn't have, uh, they couldn't text. You'd get a guy on a horse and off he would ride. So he sends a letter. And here's what his letter is targeting his next, uh, well, his next kills. I guess that's the only way <laughs> can say it, huh? I mean, if I'm going to say literally what's going on, Mike? Yeah, I just, um, it just uh, occurred to me that the only wife that we know that Ahab had was Jezebel, and yet he's got 70 sons. Did I miss something somewhere in the, is that understood or implied or? <laughs> well, of course, some of these would be sons, some would be grandsons. Oh, okay. Because we know that the scriptures just says sons. Okay. But uh, yeah, that'd be really something. Plus, I, you know, I'm not quite sure of what uh, the Baal practice was for kings, but I would imagine it would be pretty loose, you know. So, uh, okay. As, and now here's the letter that he writes. You ready? Starts in verse 2. To the leaders in Samaria, here's the letter. Now, as soon as this letter comes to you, since your master's sons, and again, I would think that means sons and grandsons, Ahab, the descendants of Ahab, are with you, and you have chariots and horses, don't you? And a fortified city also, and you have weapons. Why don't you choose, and I did the why don't you, <laughs> choose the best qualified of your master's sons, set him on your father's throne, and fight for your master's house. All right, in so many words, let me tell you what Jehu's letter is saying. Jehu's letter is saying, I'm so ready to go to war with you. Are you sure you want to mess with me? Well, do you? Do you feel lucky, Samaria? <laughs> That's what he's saying right here. Verse 4. But they were exceedingly afraid and said, Look, two kings could not stand up to him. How then can we stand? All right, he's already taken out Joram, right? And he's already taken out Ahaziah, right? Plus Jezebel by the hand of her own servants. Verse 5. And he who was in charge of the house, and he who was in charge of the city, the elders also, and those who reared the sons, sent to Jehu, here's the answer to his letter, saying, We are your servants, and we will do all you tell us, but we will not make anyone king. Uh, do what is good in your sight. So they pretty much roll over, don't they? Right there. They do not want to mess with Jehu. Verse 6, then he wrote a second letter to them saying, All right, if you are for me and will obey my voice, take the heads of the men, your master's sons, and come to me at Jezreel by this time tomorrow. Now the king's sons, 70 persons, were with the great men of the city 
who were rearing them. So some of these were kids. So it was when the letter came to them that they took the king's sons and slaughtered 70 persons, put their heads in baskets, and sent them to Jezreel. Then a messenger came and told him, saying, They have brought the heads of the king's sons. And he said, Lay them in two heaps at the entrance of the gates until morning. This was very much a Canaanite practice. The Canaanites would do this, you remember? And they were pretty serious when they went into battle. So they just would stack the heads of their enemies that they had killed right there. And that's what he does. Let me ask you, did God tell him to do that? No. Okay. <laughs> and he said, lay them in two heaps at the entrance of the gate until morning. So it was in the morning that he went out and stood and said to all the people, here's his, this, he's such a politician. He goes, you are righteous. In other words, uh, you know, nobody here did anything wrong. You, we're all good here. Indeed, uh, I conspired against my master. So he's owning up to what he did, killing Ahab's son, and killed him. But who killed all these? He, he's like, you know how politicians can be real slippery? He's saying, well, I didn't, I didn't kill these people. We're, we're good here. You know that I was here all night. So don't look at me. I didn't kill them. You know? Uh, so he's taking, like, no responsibility, whatever. I don't know. He's also saying, in a certain sense, I want to be feared. I could do this without even being there. And he says, who killed these 70 heads? He's so crafty. But I'll tell you what. You might want to mark verse 10. In, uh, in this chapter because I think it's absolutely this I'm going to give it to him on this one this is profound so he says to all the people he says if only he knew this know now that nothing shall fall to the earth of the word of the Lord which the Lord spoke concerning the house of Ahab for the Lord has done what he spoke by his servant Elijah. Now, I want to stop there for just a second, and I want to kind of reword what he's saying, because what he says, we too can say. And what we can say is, what the Lord speaks will come to pass. Amen. Period. End of story. It shall not fail. It shall not fall to the earth. And I want you to notice what he says at the very end. And notice at the end of the verse where it reads, the Lord has done what he spoke by his servant Elijah. Okay, uh, here's what I think is so cool about The Lord did what he said by his servant Elijah. He's going to do what he said by his servant Jeremiah, what he does by his servant Hosea, by all, all of them, by Ezekiel. Come on, tell me Ezekiel's not awesome. When, you, when Ezekiel said, before the Lord comes back, I will form uh, all these certain nations will come together and form alliances. And it's exactly what we see today. I mean, it's like shocking how clear it is, you know. I was like getting close to, you know, almost 3,000 years ago. And he said exactly what nations would be together. Everything that God has said through his servants will come to pass, <laughs> including this guy's. That he will never leave us nor forsake us. Amen. How do you like that one? Yeah. No, I, I love that. Again, for us looking at the whole of the Bible, the Lord does what he speaks to his prophets. Verse 11, So Jehu killed all who remained of the house of Ahab in Jezreel, and all his great men, and his closest acquaintances... And his priests, until he left none remaining. This is a heavy judgment, but but I need to ask you something. Did God tell him to kill his acquaintances? <clears throat> he didn't, did he? No. So right, he's going beyond. Now, if you want to look at a little bit of the psyche of Jehu, Jehu wants to be king, and he doesn't want any anybody to mess with his rule. So what he's doing is he's killing anybody. He wants to kill 
bring judgment of what God said to bring judgment, but anybody else that gets in his way or he perceives as being a problem, he's going to take them out too. Verse uh, 12, now, now we move on here. Now he arose and departed and went to Samaria. So he's on his way to Samaria, where all of Ahab's descendants have been beheaded. And on the way at Beth Eked of the shepherds, Jehu met, pay attention, with the brothers of Ahaziah, king of Judah. Didn't he, isn't he responsible for putting Ahaziah to, to death? He is. But remember, they don't have uh, the, the, the 11 o'clock news. Uh, so these guys apparently know nothing about hmm. what has happened. They just seem to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. So, a, so Jehu sees them and he says, hey, who are you guys? And uh, they say, well, uh, we are the brothers of Ahaziah. And we've come down to greet the sons of the king and the sons of the queen mother. Oops. <laughs> Those are the heads that have been piled up at the gates, right? Mm -hmm. So it just seems to be a sad thing that these guys have picked this time to visit. Oh. Verse 14, doesn't it? Verse 14, and he said, take them alive. So they took them alive and killed them at the well of Beth Achan. Forty-two men, and he left none of them. Uh, didn't he just say that what the Lord says will come to pass? And, and is he not here going beyond what the Lord said? All right, check this out. Here is somebody being used by God for judgment against a king who was evil and disobedient. And isn't he then right now being a king who is doing evil and being disobedient? I wonder why that doesn't like click in his head, you know? I guess, uh, what does the Bible say? Every man's way seems right in his own eyes. Mm -hmm. And uh, our sins look horrible on somebody else. But on us, they don't look so bad. <laughs> That's the kind of thing. Verse 15. Now, when he departed from there, he met Jonadab, the son of Rahab, coming to meet him. And he greeted him and said to him, Is your heart right? as my heart is towards your heart. Okay, let's talk about Jonadab for a second. He's a good guy. Mm -hmm. We like him a lot. And those who follow him and his family are all good people. As a matter of fact, later on through the prophet Jeremiah, God will speak of Jonadab and those who followed him, and the Lord will call him a faithful man. And so he's a good guy. These people took a stand in dark times against the immorality of the world around them, and they kept themselves separate to the Lord. So we should be like this. I don't care how anybody else lives around you, Christian. You've been called to live a certain way. You live a separated life to the Lord. Uh, here's what uh, uh, the Bible commentators Patterson and Ostell had to say. Uh, Jeremiah records that Janadab was the leader of an aesthetic group that lived an austere, nomadic life in the desert, drinking no wine and depending solely on the Lord for their sustenance. Separatists to the core and strong patriots, they lived in protest to the materialism and religious compromise in Israel. So this is a really good guy that uh, Jehu has come across. And Jehu says, hey, is your heart towards me like my heart is towards you? So, uh, but let me tell you what Je Jehu must be thinking. Hey, this is Janadab, and he really has the, you know, he has a good reputation, well thought of by the people. Uh, if people see me with him, this could make my stature even grow greater. Verse 15, Jeronadab answered, It is, Jehu said. If it is, give me your hand. So he gave him his hand, and he took him up into the chariot. Then he said, Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. 
It almost sounds like a brag, doesn't it? Mm. Let me show you what I am doing for the Lord. Let me show you what, what I can do for the Lord. Let me show you how I'm taking care of all these evil people. Uh, look, the Lord did, takes no delight in the death of the wicked. And, and neither should we. The very best thing that can happen to your enemies is that they would repent and give their life to Christ. I mean, Jesus paid for their sins. So, uh, so they had him ride in his chariot. Jehu is really out for himself. Uh, and uh, he sees this as a great photo opportunity. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so he took him. Verse 17. And when he came to Samaria... He killed all who remained to Ahab in Samaria till he had destroyed them according to the word of the Lord which he had spoken to Elijah. So uh, that was correct. That's what he should have done. All right, now on to the worship of Baal. Then Jehu gathered all the people together and said to them, Ahab served Baal a little. Jehu will serve him much. All right, did you, did you catch that? See, does that make you go, what What did he just say? So you're looking at this and you're going, wait a minute. Uh, he's there in Samaria, and then he makes this announcement. Hey, you guys think that Ahab served Baal, you know? When do you compare it to the way I'm going to serve Baal? But, but hold on to your horses, folks, because a couple things I want to tell you. Number one, uh, by decree of Ahab and Jezebel... Baal is the God of Israel in the north. And uh, Yahweh is no longer to be worshipped, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So he rides into town, but I need to tell you that he's acting. Yeah. He's, he is, he's not only a politician and a great commander, he's pretty doggone tricky. So he's going to trick everybody. Verse 19, here, here's for this end. Watch this. Now, therefore, call to me all the prophets of Baal. I just love those little guys. All his servants and all his priests. Let no one be missing, for I have a great sacrifice for Baal. Whoever is missing shall not live, so they better all come. But Jehu acted deceptively with the intent of destroying the worshipers of Baal. So, verse 20, and Jehu said, Proclaim a solemn assembly to for Baal. So they proclaimed it. Then Jehu sent throughout all Israel, and all the worshipers of Baal came, so that there was not a man left who did not come. So they came into the temple of Baal, and the temple of Baal was full from one end to the other. And he said to the one in charge of the wardrobe, Bring out the vestments for all the worshipers of Baal. So he brought out the vestments for them. This is like, he should have like a mustache on that kind of curls, you know. He'd be going, yeah, uh, bring out the vestments. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Verse 23, And Jehu and Jenadab the son of Rahab went into the temple of Baal, and he said to the worshipers of Baal, Search and see that no servants of Yahweh are here with you, but only the worshipers of Baal. So he really is doing this thing where he's separating, isn't he? The worshipers of Baal and the worshipers of God. You know, that reminds me of uh, this uh, account we heard uh, you know, years ago, and also repeating there in China, where uh, uh, when it was illegal in Russia to worship God, uh, some a couple of soldiers busted in to this uh, this uh, uh, worship service that was taking place, and uh, they said to everybody there in the room, you can imagine it here, which <laughs> who knows, huh? The way things are going. Uh, couple of armed guards come in you you guys can't be worshiping and we could lock you all up right now but I'll tell you what I'll do 
I'll give you an opportunity to anybody who doesn't want to be caught here worshiping. Your God can leave right now. And if any of you stay, we're going to kill you right now. This is for real. So they waited for a while, and they said, are none of you leaving? Some of them got up and scampered off, but a few of them stayed there. And they go, are you real Christians, and you're really going to worship your God? Because we're going to kill you right now. And they said, yes, we are. And the two uh, soldiers put down their rifles, and they said, we're Christians too, and we wanted to worship with other real Christians. <laughs> Amen. Ooh, hallelujah. <laughs> So, uh, so here we have them separating the two. Verse twenty-four. So they went into the uh, uh, they went in to offer sacrifices and burnt offerings. Now Jehu had appointed for himself eighty men on the outside, and he said, uh, "This is called motivational speaking, by the way. <laughs> if any of you men who am, who I have brought into your hands escapes." Whoever lets him escape, it shall be his life for the life of the others. So I guess these 80 guys are probably not going to let anybody get away, are they? <laughs> Verse 25, now it happened as soon as he had made an end to offering the burnt offerings, that Jehu said to the guard and to the captains, go in and kill them. Let no one come out. And they killed them with the edge of the sword. And the guards and the officers threw them out. And they went into the inner room of the temple of Baal. And they brought out the sacred pillars out of the temple of Baal and burned them. Then they broke down the sacred pillar of Baal. They tore down the temple of Baal. And they made it a refuse dump to this day. And uh, yeah, you got it. They turned it into a restroom. <laughs> That's what it became. And uh, verse 28, Thus Jehu destroyed Baal from Israel. Mm -hmm. Isn't that something? I, I, uh, I tell you, I have to... Jehu has some redeeming qualities, doesn't he? Because no other king in the northern kingdom ever did such a thing as this to end the worship of Baal. That's pretty great. Uh, so he stands alone in that regard. And it tells us, it tells us that if any of us have any idols, and an idol can be anything. It can be another person. It can be some place, something, money, seeking pleasure. Whatever your idol, it can be self Whatever your idol is, that place is only reserved for God. And you need to tear that thing down, get rid of it, stop going there, you know. Uh, I was contacted this week uh, by a sister who was with us years ago. And uh, she was uh, into drugs and alcohol. And we, we got her to go to the ranch. And she went through the program. but. Pretty much right after that, she went right back into drugs and alcohol. Then we lost contact with her and uh, really hadn't, hadn't seen her for a number of years. And we actually feared the worst, you know. We feared, you know, we, we, we thought she was dead. So, uh, uh, but she contacted us recently. She went, she went back to the ranch again for another go around. Mm -hmm. And the second time around, it clicked. You know, she says it really clicked for me the second time. So now she's been clean and sober for, for uh, three and a half years. Mm -hmm. isn't, that, isn't that awesome? But that was the idol that needed to be dealt with ruthlessly and torn down in her life. And I think for each one of us, we need to make sure that that one spot is reserved for the Lord and the Lord alone. Mm -hmm. So verse 29. However, Jehu, check this out, did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, who had made Israel sin, that is, from the golden calves that were at Bethel and Dan. If you recall, when the, when the nation split into two, uh, the northern tribe and the southern tribe of Judah, 
that what happened in the northern tribe was Jeroboam was afraid that people would go back down to Jerusalem to worship God and they would no longer want him as king. And so what he did, what he did was, what he did, was he uh, did not allow people to go to Jerusalem that were in the northern tribes. Instead, what he did was he put up a golden calf down at the bottom of Israel and he put a golden calf up at the top of Israel and he said that's how you can worship the Lord by sacrificing at these golden calves and uh, of course you know that's all upside down and that's wrong but it's interesting that it is worshiping the right God in the wrong way you know and, and yeah people can do that through religious activities they may be worshiping the right God. In other words, you know, a God that's a three persons and one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You may talk to them. They may agree uh, who Jesus Christ is. But yet the way that they worship him uh, is uh, got nothing to do with actually connecting with God. But instead it is a list of uh, routines and rituals and man-centered activities that really have nothing to do whatsoever with a personal relationship with the living God. And uh, so it's the right God, uh, but not understanding the right way to worship. Jesus said it would be in spirit and in truth that we would worship God. So, uh, verse, and so he keeps that going with the golden calf thing. Verse 30, And the Lord said to Jehu, check this out, because you have done well in doing what is right in my sight and have done to the house of Ahab all that was in my heart, your sons shall sit on the throne of Israel to the fourth generation. But you may find that somewhat comforting, but I don't. I look at verse 30 and I think to myself, that's not very personal. That's almost very clinical. It's almost as though God is saying, you fulfilled your job, you know, function. You, you fulfilled your category uh, of, thing, of assignments. But there was really no love relationship between the Lord and, and Jehu. So, uh, you know, he holds power. He's like rewarded, so to speak, or this is his payment, so to speak. Verse 31, but Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart. For he did not depart from the sin of Jeroboam, who had made Israel sin. Now look, here's what we know. You say, well, he's, he is worshiping the right God, you know, and they're no longer worshiping idols, so he accomplished that much. And, and you kind of look at that and you go, well, yeah, that's good. And, and the Lord rewarded him to to some extent, but uh, but he took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God. The laws of the Old Testament paint a picture of what Christ is and, and, and becomes revealed to us in the New Testament. So do you see any connection between Christ and this worship of this golden calf? You, there isn't, is there? There's no picture of it. It speaks nothing of the cross or of the sacrifice of Christ. It just totally breaks the mold and breaks the picture. It is an incorrect <clears throat> picture of who Jesus Christ is. And, and that's another reason it makes it so heavy. So, let's see here. Uh, Bible commentator Poole writes, uh, herein Jehu discovers his hypocrisy, that he follows God as far as his own interests would permit, but no further. And i got to tell you, this is what I like about these Old Testament stories, accounts, and these people who we may at first glance read or we're doing our yearly read and we come across 2 Kings chapter 10, we may just fly through it and we go, well, that didn't mean anything at all to me. But we can take these people and what they did and we can apply those kind of truths to our own life. 
Am I somebody who only follows God as far as is comfortable for me? Do I only obey God to the extent that makes me feel good and no further? Because that's what Jehu did. I guess we could say that's the same with Jehu. You know, he was serving God and doing what was right because it served his purposes. And I need to check myself on these things. Verse 32. In those days, the Lord began to cut off parts of Israel. And Haziel conquered them in all the territory of Israel. From the Jordan eastward, all the land of Gilead, Gad, Reuben, and Manasseh. From Aror, by, which is by the river Arnon, including Gilead and Bashan. Do you remember these places from before they crossed into the promised land? Okay, they, they, they shouldn't have stayed there, should they? They should have crossed into the promised land. And they're the first to go. They're being conquered by their enemies. And that's exactly what the Lord told them that would happen. You started out right. You were moving the way I told you to move. But you stopped. Why did you stop? And when you stop moving forward, it gives the enemy a chance to take you out. So we're always pressing on. We're always moving forward. You know, don't stop, guys. Let's keep going, shall we? Come on, let's keep serving the Lord. You know, don't, don't get comfortable in the sense that you're going to stop seeking God. Let's go all the way. Verse 34. Now the rest of the acts of Jehu, all that he did and all his might... Are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? So Jehu rested with his fathers, and they buried him in Samaria. Then Jehoahaz, his son, reigned in his place. And the period that Jehu reigned over Israel in Samaria was 28 years. Here's what Spurgeon says, and he's, he's even harder on Jehu than I am. Here's what he wrote. Hating one sin, he loved another, and thus proved that the fear of the Most High did not reign in his breast. He was merely a hired servant and received the throne as his wages, but a child of God he never was. That's what writes. Look, for me personally, if I was going to tell you what I think about Jehu, I think, I think the Lord already gave it to us in verse 31 there in the middle where it says he took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord uh, God of Israel how with all his heart that's the key right there mm -hmm. with all his heart look heaven and earth are going to pass away and you're going to watch them pass away but God's word will never pass away mm -hmm. and whatever plans we may think that we have for ourselves. They're no match for the plans that God has for us. They don't even come close. You know, uh, what do they talk about? Uh, if you own an orchard, the trees that get that give the best fruit are the ones in the center of the orchard. The ones that are the most beat up in an orchard are the trees that are around the outside because they get hit first by pests they get hit first by weather. They get hit first by people who walk along pulling off their fruit. Mm. So what we need to decide, that's with serving God with all our hearts. Am I going to be this one who just kind of skirts on the outside of my Christianity? Mm. Or, or, or am I going to say, I'm going to live right in the center. I, I, I want to be a servant of the Most High God. Uh, you know, uh, my love for this world, I let it fade. Let it fade, your love for this world. Because nothing compares with what God has for you. Not only now, in this little tiny now and now, where we seem to be like these always, always, uh, you know, <clears throat> crying over. Mm -hmm. uh, look, I, I'm just the same as everybody else. You know, oh, I wish this were better for me. I wish this was different. I wish I had this. You know, I'm all mad about it. Who oh, come on, can't, you know? And we're all worried about this little tiny thing, this speck called the here and now, whereas God has a whole eternity for us. And look, mm -hmm. the eternity's got to be awesome. I mean, some of you love nature. we got some nature lovers here, don't we? Mm -hmm. you love, I see you, all these 10 people. 
I love to go camping too. In an RV. Yeah. <laughs> My wife loves roughing it too, as long as she has her hair blower. But uh, you think nature looks beautiful, huh, Mikey? Yeah. Mikey was just talking about yeah. this. Because uh, where'd you come back from? Uh, where were you? Mammoth Lakes. Mammoth Lakes. Okay, we all know that's spectacular. Uh, and this is a fallen nature. It's corrupt. Yeah. It's broken. It's twisted. It's got thorns and thistles. Mm. It's got animals that, you know, are against each other. It's got defects. You don't have a clue what real, you know, what real creation look. It, what do you think real creation looks like? I mean, it must be just mind-boggling. All right, not only that, but God's going to place you in creation, and you won't have any defects. Huh? Some of us, every place we go, we got to pack our baggage with us, right? <laughs> we got to the backpack, and <laughs> you won't have any baggage. I can, I can, I'll tell you, I can't even imagine that. No sin, no temptation. A God who absolutely loves me, who's got a job for me to do that I don't tire doing, and I'm scrapping over this little thing. Oh, did you hear what they said about me? <laughs> You know, what, why do we do that? I know, Abby, I know one of your favorite scriptures is out of uh, 2 Corinthians. We look on things, uh, not on things that are seen, mm -hmm. because they're temporary. But we look on things that are eternal, things that never pass away. So never be angry if you lose something that is temporal, mm -hmm. because God's going to replace it with something eternal and better. Amen. Jehu got his kingdom. And that's it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I, I thank you so much for this evening, Lord. I thank you for your word, Lord, that we can even look at these chapters and verses that are really kind of can make us stumble or we wonder what's in there for me. Well, how would you speak to me out of something like that? And yet, Holy Spirit, you do want to teach us even out of these most difficult passages so now lord i pray that you would take your word and that you would seal it to our hearts let it bring forth fruit uh, let that be fruit that remains i offer myself my brothers and sisters we offer ourselves to you lord god to be used for your purposes and your plans however you see fit lord god we recognize that you have always taken care of us Lord, I'm looking around at a room full of people that you've taken care of all their lives. And you're not going to stop that, Lord. So we're just thankful for your hand of provision. We ask that it would continue, Lord, and that we would be able to continue to walk with you in intimacy. Let everything else pass away, Lord God. Let it all pass away, Lord God, because we have you. You are our portion. You are our prize in this world. We pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name that everybody said. Amen. Let's all stand up as we close in worship.